Hold on one second. I don't think this is. Yes. Is this the is this usual? Because this is not fitting. Justin. The last one needs to be done. I just got yanked over to somebody else. They're over there. Oh, I got you. Hey, Justin. There's not an RCA on this DI, so we need to get like an adapter. It's, it's not going into his laptop. Come up and see for yourself, but it's not going in. Yeah, we're going 
Maybe it's actually work. Audio network works. No, I think it's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, it'll be okay. Not now. Okay, welcome to the administrative plenary. Uh, it's time to get started. Um, small audio problems at the beginning. Let's see how that works out um, when we go further. Um, so uh, I'm gonna go through a number of things here um, just to um, set things up a little bit. I just want to show you a couple of pictures in, in one uh, video. And, and the first thing is that the RFC editor team has been expanding recently. So, you know, many new editors, new attendees. The other thing is that, I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed the, the social event yesterday. And uh, particularly the hat, of course. And I'll be wearing this from now on. Uh, but the <clears throat> thing I, I did want to warn you about is that, you know, this is Texas. If you go out, like yesterday, we went out 
be careful, there might be some IAB cowboys around. Um, anyway, so I did want to show you, uh, instead of just the static Im images, a video, and this is, you know, many of you have participated in the Imagining, imagining the Internet uh, research from Elon University people. Um, here's the URL if you want to go and re uh, look at the actual details. They have tracked um, things over a long period of time, so that's actually quite interesting, uh, substantive-wise. But they also make a video out of these events that they go to. And uh, let's see if I can actually show it to you now. What is the internet? I mean, to me, uh, it's almost like oxygen, you know? <laughs> it's something that is always there. It's the best, the best thing the mankind ever developed. It is the entity which will essentially change our planet and the way we live. I think it's an amazing source of information. Amazing. I think amazing. A lot of opportunity. It has the potential to provide people with uh, equal access. It's bright. Connecting all of us, hopefully securely. What we do with it is what's going to determine how bright our future remains. Transformative, it's wonderful, secure. Everything for everyone. Impressive. Stormy. Ubiquitous. Honestly, it's awesome. A global, easy communication mechanism. Very easy to use. It will be so much part of our life that we won't think about it. One thing I would say is Big Brother and Big Media. Everything will be connected. I see low cats. <laughs> big, it's big, man. We cannot imagine a world without internet. Internet has to survive. It's one of the greatest things that we humans have, and we have to keep it. The internet today is a whole bunch of people shouting and uh, people trying to choose who to listen to. To me, consensus is not as important as rigorously good, excellent technical engineering. And we're moving away. Is everything you can imagine and you cannot imagine. The future of the internet is open, bright, and fantastic. The biggest single issue I would say for the internet, not from a policy perspective, I'm concerned about policy, but, uh, but in terms of technology and deployment, is making it, in fact, global. None of these are unsolvable problems. They're hard problems, but none of them are inside. I would hate to, to have to look into the crystal ball and tell you exactly what's going to come. I don't think any of us can do that, but I'm very confident that it's going to be very exciting. I think it's a bright future. It's going to be far bigger than we, we have it today. Today we think it's, you know, that it's been a big success, but it's really far, far bigger and impacts our lives far more, more than it has so far. Good stuff, many uh, interesting insights. A right, good summary. Um, Okay, so the agenda that we have today, um, this, this is the welcome. Um, I'm going to recognize the host. There's no host speeds this time. Um, we're very grateful for, for Google for hosting us. Um, and then we'll do some reporting. I'll, I'll provide a brief report. The IOC IAD will do that. Trust, uh, Nomcom. We can talk about something called Code Match. Um, we can talk about the hackathon that went on um, before the ITF, uh, week, uh, during the weekend before the ITF. Uh, we have an announcement related to Postal Award, uh, and then we're going to look at ITF 93 and thank um, our outgoing members and then open it up for two open mic sessions. And um, the first thing, I just wanted to thank Google uh, for your efforts or your support for this meeting. We could not do it without you. Um, and um, uh, Warren, are you here? Yeah, I forgot my hat. <laughs> so, 
thank you. And um, I'm your fake what? Um, <laughs> you only have one. And you can you one. <laughs> thank you very much. And I also wanted to highlight we have a number of other sponsors as well uh, for connectivity. Uh, for the hackathon, Cisco was sponsoring that. We have a Bits and Bytes event coming up uh, with a bunch of companies supporting it. You'll see Huawei three times there, by the way. That means they have three tables. Um, lots of things to show, I guess. Uh, and then we go to um, my report. And I wanted to talk about just, you know, the brief report on where the participants came this time and how many people we have. Talk a little bit about the ITF network, talk about the IST restructuring, uh, talk about code, the hackathon, and other, other things. Um, talk about uh, our own, own patch person and harassment policies. Um, briefly mention the INS stewardship transition. And then uh, mention the one appeal that we have gotten this period. We also have more stuff online, so we're not going to show everything now. Our RFC editor, secretariat. Final reports and NOC reports are there. Actually, I didn't have the link here for the NOC report, but it's up on the proceedings page. And of course, we also have uh, the ITF blog or the chairs blog. Actually, it's not only the chairs blog uh, nowadays. There's plenty of articles written by other um, other people as well. So take a look at that. It should be an art article um, quite often there. Um, the participants. Uh, 1,176 people on site, 172 newcomers, um, and this is uh, a little bit down from last year, but then we were in London, and that's a very good place in terms of um, you know, transport and flights and such. So it's difficult to beat that. So we actually bypassed our estimations or budgets, so it's a good result. Thank you all for coming here. Uh, 57 countries, which I believe is a very good result as well. Again, London, uh, three more countries, but uh, that, that was a difficult place to be. Uh, I want to mention a few network news. Um, there's been new arrangements in our wireless networks, as you've noticed, in terms of the SSIDs and security settings. Um, they caused a big shift in encrypted traffic, by the way. So some of us have been saying that we should have more security in the internet and now we're actually eating our own dog food in some some sense so it uh, switched from 30 percent encrypted traffic to about 80. that's a big shift um and uh, actually i want to mention one thing related to that so this is of course itf network and this is this is what we do here um, but this is of course a more general trend um not just because of snowden revelations and other things but Generally, for the last five years or so, amount of encrypted traffic has been on the rise in the internet, um, and it does, you know, it's it's a it's a good thing, but it also has or causes some challenges. Uh, traffic management in a situation where you have all all traffic basically encrypted is is going to be, let's say, more painful, and we'll need to invent some new ways of doing that. Um, the uh, some members of the ISC and IAB visited the uh, GSM Operators Association a couple of weeks ago, and, and that this was one of the topics that was talked about. How, what can we do with regards to traffic management under this new future? The other thing that I wanted to mention uh, related back to the ITF network is DNSSEC. It's being tested on the ITF web pages, uh, hosted on a CDM provider, Cloudflare. Um, and we've had a test version, and I believe we were going to make a switch real soon now. Not sure if we can do that this week, but soon, um, where the test version is no longer just the test version, but it's still live. So when you are clicking through the usual ITF web pages, um, it goes to a set of names that are actually protected by the NSSEC, assuming your, your system supports that, of course. Um, and also the meeting network that where everything that we have here on site um, is under a particular domain um, and that has been transformed to DNSSEC as well. So more, more dog food for us, I guess. Then in the last five or six months, we've been talking about restructuring the ITF areas a little bit. 
wanted to provide an update on that. Um, so just to highlight again, what, why are we doing this? So it's first of all, the mass IPF structure to current topics. What you all do is, is the important thing and we want to match the management structure with that as well. And you know, as part of that, we want to support growth in emerging topic areas, and including you know, many efforts that relate to various open source uh, projects um, and you know, match management resource to workload, provide better flexibility. And what we have been doing so far, and this is more or less done now, um, flexible assignment of ADs to working groups. So we're not as strict anymore that you have to manage your area, your, your working group from your area, and you cannot manage anything else, even if you personally happen to have a lot of expertise in this particular topic that the working group is working on. So we're making that more flexible. We're making the definition of areas a little bit more flexible. So it's not exactly two, area, two ADs, but it can actually be three in some cases, for instance. We provide an additional focus on data models, Yang, and the routing area, or active um, topics. We're making a uh, bigger reorganization for the apps and uh, uh, real-time applications areas, um, creating the art area, which is not done yet. We decided to do this. Actual buttons to be pushed have not been done yet. Um, I'll get, down, uh, get to that in a moment. Um, we're also down to three ADs for, for those two areas from previous four. And there's been various working group moves between the area directors and, and areas. So what's going to happen next? Um, we're going to complete the creation of the art area, uh, pending that you know, all the ADs are in place. Like today, we're making a switch. Um, we're going to be doing um, some things in parallel. There's one RFC, a PCP related to the um, uh, um, uh, dispatch working group from Rye area that talks about Rye area in, you know, in, in specific terms, and we'll we'll make a small edit there and reissue that. You'll be seeing that document coming out soon. Um, we will have to deliver um, desired expertise or desired qualifications for new, new ADs for the next round at some point, um, May, June timeframe. So this, the whole thing will probably complete uh, in May, June timeframe, the, the creation of the new area. And as a part of this, some additional working groups may also move out, but that is something that we do all the time anyway, a little bit. Reconsider where, where the working groups best fit and who has the best expertise to manage them. So that's the short term, uh, long term stuff. Um, this is still, I mean, it's just organization. It's not so exciting, actually. It's just a structure, you know, two boxes, three boxes, who cares? Um, um, but what we are doing now, um, starting a team at the IST to look at the reduction of IST tasks and workload, you could actually either remove completely some things that don't make sense to do at all, or um, move them to to um, other people who have you know better uh, capabilities to deal with those things. As an example, we are going to look at further reorganization in the TSV area. Basically, with the idea that um, we need to have the area defined and the AD roles such that the typical candidates that we find um, willing to do AD jobs for that area could actually do it. In the case of TSP, for instance, we've had um, some academics and people who are very, very uh, busy in their current roles in, in the commercial world who find it difficult to do a full-time task. So we're looking at that, what can, what can we do there? And, and this is obviously linked also to the previous item, but we're, we're looking at TSP in particular. There's other variables too than, than the definition of the AD, AD task. Um, and of course, once there are early ideas, we'll bring it to you. We're not gonna make a complete proposal and then say, you know, this, this is the whole thing. We'll, we'll engage in discussion early enough. And again, um, the ISD organization is just organization. Um, what really is important is what you all do. Like how many people here, there are here, it's, it's kind of a side issue. Um, and you all are actually doing those important things. I'm just be proud of the, achievements we've been 
we have done in the uh, last months, as an example, um, HTTP2 came out. Um, so let's let's focus on that rather than the organization. We'll we'll try to match the organization to something sensible here on the IC side as well. Um, code, running code. That's always been important, right? And um, you know, for various reasons, and the, the world moves even faster now than it has in the past. And there's a lot of things that actually run you know, more on code than on specifications. There's um, the role of code is is getting even more important than it has been in the past. Um, and just wanted to highlight what kinds of things we've been to, or some examples of things we've done in this ITF, and hopefully we can do some more in the future ones. We've had once again the code sprint, and this is about you all, or you know, a small set of people of us, are working on the ITF tools for for the purpose of ITF work. Uh, we had a hackathon um, from uh, uh, Saturday to Sunday last weekend. Uh, 40 to 50 people participated, and from my perspective, it, the, the results were really good, and everyone was very excited. Um, Code mats, um, Kathleen and Lysander will be talking about that in a moment. Um, and Charles also will come in a moment to look at the hackathon in more detail. And of course, you all are also working with your colleagues and, and your um, you know, partners uh, on various kinds of things, um, unofficially and, um, and so on. So it's all good. And I just want to say that we are open for more experiments and new ideas in this space. So if you have things in your mind of what, what if the ITF could help you do something or you know maybe there was an opportunity for the ITF to set up a list or a meeting room or something that would help your work um, with internet technology also code wise then let us hear about it and in that vein actually one thing that we did decide today we had a discussion with ISC and IOC as well and decided that we are going to continue the hackathon experience um, also in, at the next ITF in Prague. Uh, these are the dates. Um, and now I think, I mean, for this ITF, we made all the uh, announcements and planning very late. And that, was, of course, affected when people can join it. Now you have more time. So now would be a good time to start thinking, you know, what, what if you could come to do the ITF meeting and spend a couple of days uh, coding something and maybe working with your um, partners or, or competitors or, or um, colleagues or students from somewhere. Um, and um, you, you, I mean, the, the technical topics are, of course, up to you to be decided. Um, it's completely open. The ITF doesn't really want to dictate this. This is just a place for you to do interesting work and, and maybe connect um, possibly in planned ways, possibly in surprising ways. So do take note of that, and and hopefully we'll get up uh, pages around the, you know, wiki pages around the, the potential topics and sign up sheets and so forth on the web soon. But uh, keep this in mind. Um, and then we've had on the list quite a lot of discussion recently about the harassment policy RFC that we're trying to make. I just wanted to um, talk about that a little bit, and not just the potential RFC, but this this um, setup more in more general. So in 2013, the ISC issued an anti-harassment policy, which is still we uh, still uh, there and it's still applicable, and we should all take that into account when we um, work in, in an organization like this. Um, so basically, it just says that we all need to behave in a professional fashion. And we also set up, you know, just in case for, for the eventual possibility that someone doesn't do that um, properly, then uh, we have a person, Linda Cleeforth. Linda, are you here? Oh, there she is. So if, if you have any issues, please contact her. This is her um, uh, email address, or just, if you see her around here, uh, you can go, go talk to her um, and, and see if, um, if you can get uh, assistance. Okay, so, but that, that's an ISG statement that, that we had, um, and we have some, you know, um, support for, for dealing with issues. 
What we did want to do is um, develop an RFC level community uh, requirement for this. And um, we've had this draft in development draft for us, nickel harassment, uh, currently in 06 version. Um, the first goal of that draft is to upgrade the ISC statement into a community uh, RFC and kind of um, has more weight, I think. Um, the secondary goal is to provide more specific procedures for dealing with situations. Um, and, and this is, we believe, an improvement, um, it, but it's still about like, it's about human interactions rather than computer protocols. Um, so it you know, may not be perfect in the sense of specifying all kinds of situations. So it's probably not, not the last word in this, this field. Um, so we went through the development of the uh, document. We did the last call document progress to ISC approval. Um, and there was discussion on the ISC and during the last call and some changes were made to accommodate some of that discussion. Uh, and once we did that in 06, a concern was raised with, with the changes that they seemed unintentionally, I, I might add, uh, indicate that the leadership is not under the same rules, but rather only recall procedures. And, you know, as you know, we have for the non-com elected persons in the ITF leadership, we have uh, a procedure for recalling a person if, if they're not performing as ex expected. Uh, and, and indeed, this was un unintentional and not, not meant to be in any, any kind of exception for the leadership. Um, any potential misbehavior by anybody, including the leadership, will be taken very seriously. And not just after this RFC is published, but also today with, um, you know, when, when Linda is looking at something, then she will, um, she will take it very seriously in any case. Um, so anyway, we had a big discussion or have a big discussion. What should we do and exactly how that should be formulated? Um, I think the existing statement is good, but having this community back BCP on this topic would actually be an important update, I think. And I think many, many people do agree with that. Um, my plan is not to reopen the whole document for discussion but uh, we do need to address the substantial issues that people had, and which basically are the ombuds team versus recall procedures, what to do with confidentiality in, in very serious cases, and what's the appeals path in those same cases, and try to get a new version that addresses those. And my plan for doing that is, is to try to form a design team. Uh, I'll, pick a few persons uh, from among you and, and um, see if, if that team could come quickly to a conclusion that we can actually um, produce a document and discuss that again on the list. But again, hopefully on, on this limited scope of changes rather than opening everything. Okay, that's that. Um, I also want to mention IANA stewardship transition. So this is about US government role going away from IANA. So it's not about changing what the IETF does. We still do exactly what we've done in the past. It's not about changing what the ICANN does in their IANA department. They will still be doing exactly what they've been doing before and we, we use their help in this, in, in running this function. Um, but anyway, so as, as this change was announced, we set up a process um, where bulk of the responsibility for designing what actually needs to change um, to the communities being served. So in the case of protocol parameters, that would be the IETF. Um, and now um, after half a year in, into the process, the IETF and RIs have completed their proposals. Um, the, uh, I should mention actually the INAPLAN working group, we formed it in late August, early September, I think. And work completed from their perspective in I think it was late November or early December. Um, the document was approved by the ISG uh, in late December and then actual final approval notice went out in, in early January. So that, that was a fairly quick operation for the document that um, it was still substantial, even though we didn't make a lot of changes, but it is a substantial topic and we have to do it carefully. So um, that's very good work. Thank you all who participated. Uh, and that went to something called Ana Transition Coordination Group or ICG, which is 
taking these proposals from IETF, RIRs, ICANN, putting them together, making sure that they fit together, and then sending it forward to the NTIA or the US government. Um, they've looked at our proposal, um, had a clarifying question, one question, which was actually both to the IETF and RIRs, which we responded. I think Tobias will briefly mention that later in his presentation from the trust. Um, and at this point, we're basically looking forward to successful implementation of this plan. Um, mindful of two facts, however, first of all, one of the three communities is not done yet because they have a bigger task ahead of them themselves. So, you know, that there might be implications from that work coming towards us. So we need to watch that carefully, obviously. And also, of course, the international attention on this topic is, is huge, um, including U.S. Um, political scene uh, and even the U.S. Congress. So uh, what's this space? I, I mean, we, we all need to be looking at what's happening and we need to respond if, if we need to do anything. My personal belief is that everything that we possibly would need to do additional is more in the category of explanation and uh, assurance. Yes, this has actually worked for 30 years or 15 years quite well. And, and there's no, no, no cause for concern or, or bigger change. However, mm, uh, I mentioned this INA plan process and the document that we approved. We did get an appeal on that uh, from JFC Morphin. Um, appeal the IIC concerning the, the approval of, the, of this draft. Um, I see response is, is being prepared, again, carefully, um, although in this case, uh, it takes a while to read the 77 page um, appeal for this, I think it's like a 20, 20 page document. Um, but we're, we're, we're taking this seriously, obviously, and, and um, going to ensure that, that we do the right thing. And appeals, of course, in general, not just in this case, it's an opportunity to correct the mistake. Hey, you forgot to do this thing, please you go and fix it. Okay, let's, let's look at it again, make sure we, we did everything right. But it's not, an opportunity for any particular person to override an, a discussion that we already had in a working group. So it's not a, it's not like if you shout in a crowded room, um, it, it, it should not give you more voice because you're making an appeal. So that's my report. Um, and I think, let's see, where, where are we? I go see next, I believe. There we go, yes, uh, Ray and Tobias. Okay, howdy. I don't know about you, but uh, when I was five years, I dreamed of wearing a head like this. I don't know whether you can relate with that, but that was one of my childhood dreams. Finally, I achieved it, okay? <laughs> Took a couple of decades, but okay. Um, to answer your first question, no, I am not Chris. Uh, I'm Tobias. Um, I'm a fellow member of Chris at the IOC, and um, as uh, IETF trust chair, um, I'm here on behalf of Chris giving this presentation. Unfortunately, he had uh, urgent personal commitments that uh, did not allow him to give this presentation himself. Um, so I will do this on his behalf. So this is just a couple of the usual acronyms. Uh, so you know what you're talking about, ISA, IOC, IED. Um, let me start with the most important thing, or one of the most important things, which is, again, to thank you, Google, uh, and our sponsors for this meeting. Um, without meeting hosts, it would be extremely difficult uh, to make our budgets work. So um, let me express our heartfelt thanks to our sponsors here today. And a second, thank you for the hat. Um, 
we had uh, about no 40, 46 people more than we expected. Uh, so we are quite good on the budgeting for this. Um, sponsorship registration fees are on target. So in this regard, uh, this is uh, from a financial perspective, a successful meeting. Um, I want to also look back at um, the Honolulu meeting. Uh, at Honolulu, we had below expectation, below forecast attendees, which uh, gave us um, about 68K below forecast in our budget, which is not so bad because the two meetings before that in Toronto and London were far above our expectations. So overall, the budget for 2014 uh, looks very nice, looks very good. Uh, we did cancel the bits and bytes in Honolulu, um, which also resulted in less sponsorships, which did not have a material impact on the budget because corresponding to less sponsorships, we also had less expenses for hosting the bits and bytes. So in the end, uh, the difference in our budget is, is not uh, significant. Um, yeah, you, you also have a link at the bottom about the details, so for all the financials. Uh, some meeting news. So um, the next upcoming meetings, um, as you can see, we will be in Prague, uh, Yokohama, and in one year's time in Buenos Aires. I think the first time for us to go to this continent. Um, we have, yeah, I will go to this. Um, for those of you who want to book hotels early, we have a page at the bottom with the link about upcoming uh, hotel venues. So you can go there and you can receive that information and well, you can potentially make your booking long time in advance. Oops, this is, let's see. Oh, okay, it seems the slides is not the latest deck, Oops. but that doesn't matter because I know what should be there. So I will just say that instead. Um, so there are two announcements to make. First, for Prague, we are proud to announce that we have found a sponsor as a host, which is CZ Nick and Brocade. So thank you very much for that. That's highly appreciated. Yeah. And I believe they are also here tonight, and potentially also outside. There's a desk, I think, for Prague, uh, which is upcoming in July. And the second announcement is um, we know where we are going in ITF 97, which is we will be going to Korea, to Seoul. So, yeah, I'm quite happy about that. I don't know about you. Um, so we will continue our commitment to 111, and uh, we will continue our commitment to also go to Asia. Uh, we are working hard on ITF 99 and 100, but we are not ready to announce that yet. Good. So the meeting news, this is uh, yeah, one, of, uh, one further meeting news. As you can imagine, Latin America is uh, a new step for us. It is also a great opportunity for us to increase our outreach in that region and to increase awareness of what the IETF does. In that uh, context, um, ISOC is kindly helping us a lot by hosting there a couple of run-up activities in the different countries. You can see a list here, like Costa Rica, Peru, Brazil, Chile, Argentina. It feels like a whole promotion tour, like for the election of the ne next president or something. So this is a great opportunity to uh, raise awareness and to bring in more people from this region to the IETF. And in addition to that, we also have local hubs in Latin America, which are participating in uh, certain uh, working groups. So for example, um, at this one, at ITF 92 for v V6 Ops, RTC Web, and so on. Local hub would be a room where several people come together and they have a, a broadband connection to our meeting. We intend to continue this with local hubs over this year. So also for ITF 93 and 94. And so if you're in Latin America, this might be an opportunity for, for you to participate remotely as well. And uh, as a last step, our project news, uh, we have actually a couple of projects uh, going on uh, and in good shape. So we have the ITF website re revamp underway, uh, RFC digital objects identified project, 
we have the RC editor website revamp. We are signing IDs again. So we had some technical issues, but uh, these are solved. So we, we are able to sign, to digitally sign our IDs. Um, we will extend the, the RFP deadline for software developers uh, for some contracts. Uh, we, we plan to have the IMAP access to IET, IETF email archives likely available in April. So hopefully next month, you should be able to access your, uh, the archives via IMAP, which I find quite useful. Um, and the data tracker, uh, one of the key tools for the IETF, at least from what I hear, is undergoing a facelift and will be expected to be available before Prague. So thanks a lot to all the project uh, members and contributors there. I think this is amazing work that uh, you are doing for us and um, that is really great, great, greatly appreciated. Uh, and last but not least, um, our, a little view on our financials. Um, so we are, in terms of budget, last year was quite good for us. Our uh, revenues were above our uh, expectations. Our expenses were roughly on target. Um, and we had less um, expenses for tools, which was because, not because everything was cheaper, it was because we were not ready yet uh, with the statements of work to get this work uh, issued. So the um, savings we have there of 180,000 for tools will be expenses that we, ex uh, that we expect to do in 2015 and 2016. So it's not we don't do it, it's just we have to do it a little bit later because the statements of work did take longer to prepare. So in total, um, we also needed less support from ISOC this year. So ISOC was is, is always kind to help us um, kind of make ends meet. And um, so this year, ISOC will be contributing uh, 1.6 million uh, to the IETF operation. And uh, we had a lot of uh, contributions from Cisco and I believe also some other um, uh, helpers in terms of equipment, software, and services in the range of over $800,000. Again, details about our financial statements are uh, at the link provided at the bottom of the slide. Good, and with this, I hand over to Ray for uh, to give the presentation as our IAD. Thank you. Slide up. <laughs> so we're going to scroll right through the first part here. There's the picture of Soul you missed the first time. There's the <laughs> logos for Brocade and CZ Nick. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, visas. We did discuss visas, right? Do you want to mention yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's important. Sorry. Thank you. It's important. Um, we, we had some visa issues last time um, for people coming to the U.S. There, there was some processing uh, difficulties and delays, and that resulted in a couple of people not being able to attend. Uh, as a result of that, we decided to open registration earlier uh, to make it easier for people to apply earlier for their visa. So we did this for Dallas already. We opened registration for Dallas while we were in Honolulu, and we will open registration for Prague this week. So you will be able to register quite early, and that way you should be able to get your visa quite safely. Uh, in addition to that, um, we noticed that th the problems for the visa seems not to persist anymore. So um, this year for Dallas, we had a much, much better uh, visa processing and barely any uh, issues with visa issuing. So this might be due to a change in policy by the US government on how to process visa and how long visa would be valid. So you can open basically by the end of the week, and I invite you to register for ITF and Park then. Yeah, and this is what we already had, and I hand back to Ray. Thank you. 
Um, so my part of this is to give thanks to a lot of folks who uh, make these events actually happen for us. You can see in Code Sprint, uh, this is headed up by Robert Sparks and Henrik, uh, who do, do a great job. We have 15 folks that come in early, spend a whole day uh, developing tools, improving tools for use of the com by the community, um, and that's a great effort on their part. Then, of course, uh, we, the network operation has, is not has not been a problem since Minneapolis in 2004, somewhere around there. <laughs> and basically due to uh, the NOC volunteers in Veriland and um, these folks here on this team run by Jim Martin. And thank you very much, Jim. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Google. We appreciate it. Did a great job, Warren, uh, Denise, uh, Vint. Thanks for all your support. All right, take our hats off to you. Thank you. Howdy. Okay, Time Warner Cable uh, connectivity for two meetings in a row. Thank you very much, Time Warner Cable. Uh, bits and bytes, make sure you go there tomorrow night. We got a great, uh, great presentation for folks. Um, so we've had a little bit of turnover in the IOC. We want to welcome the new folks to the, uh, the IOC, Lou Berger, uh, Benson Schleser, and Andrew Sullivan. Uh, thanks for volunteering and uh, participating. We're going to have a fun couple of years coming up. Um, we also want to thank, thank uh, Randy Bush, Bob Hinn, and Russ Housley. Uh, the IOC is um, 10 years old, and of those 10 years, both Bob and Russ have served eight on those uh, for the IOC. And uh, Bob has served as chair for more than four years, only giving it up when he became the chair of the ISOC Board of Trustees. So for all of you guys, thank you for your, your service to the IETF, for your leadership, for your guidance to me and my day-to-day -day responsibilities. I, I've learned a lot. You're obviously not done with me, um, so I'm sure you'll continue to give me guidance as the community does. So thanks for your service. And we've had some elections, <laughs> and uh, it's hard to believe that people would come back from war, but Chris Griffiths and uh, Tobias both came back from war, and they're going to serve one more year as, uh, as chairs of the, I of the IOC and the IETF Trust. And we're going to see you all in Prague, right? They got great beer. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I mean, I could potentially do this even without slides, but I think we, we, we better go visual as well. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so this is um, probably the more dry part of the evening because the trust tends to be uh, a little bit dryish, but please bear with me. It's, it's only a few minutes. Um, so in this case, uh, presenting as the IETF trust chair, we have uh, four, four topics to discuss. Um, so the first one is just a quick report uh, about the current subpoenas that are going on. Uh, in November last year, we received two of them. And just this month, I think one week ago, we received uh, a new subpoena uh, from GenBand versus Metaswitch Networks. Uh, a list of the subpoenas is at the link provided at the bottom for your information. Um, we also had the uh, pleasure of receiving a lawsuit filed against the IETF, among others, uh, last year, uh, which uh, gave us quite some work to do, especially our legal attorneys. Um, and at the, sta at the time, uh, we were advised not to discuss this uh, during an ongoing um, case. Um, the case has been, um, what would you say, the judge did, uh, did issue an order to strike the complaint in October. 
And um, there were some kind of uh, tries to amend this. And even today, there are certain, um, so the complaint is closed, but the plaintiff has still made further attempts to um, change the location of the court or reopen the case, which has so far not happened. Um, number three is, um, as, you, as Yari mentioned before, um, the Diana uh, Plan Working Group has asked us um, as the trust whether we would be willing to hold intellectual property rights related to the Diana function if we were asked to. And a vote to this effect was made. And so, yes, we would be willing if somebody would ask us, we would be willing to hold IPR uh, related to the Diana function. Um, and last. Uh, last but not least, um, we did recently an update to the trust legal provision. Uh, the last one was from 2009 version 4.0, and we made a small amendment to that uh, with the, uh, with the uh, new capability that we can in the future use templates and that people can change, uh, no, can enter data into these templates uh, without uh, risking any IP infringements. So, um, yeah, the, the new version should be online today. Yes, it is. It is version 5.0 as of March 25th, 2015. The link is on the slide. And, um, yeah. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your patience. And um, I hand back to Gary, I think. Yeah, Michael, can you come up? Hi, my name is Michael Richardson, um, and uh, I'm the uh, past uh, or, or just finishing NOMCOM chair, and I'm going to tell you a little bit what uh, we've been up to. Um, we, we made great use of local labor to do our interviews in Honolulu, um, and as you can see, if you weren't there, there were a large number of minions available, um, and so we did. This is a slight improvement over what happened a couple of years ago. Uh, when we were in Orlando, you might remember the NOMCOM process was in fact managed the Hogwarts way, um, and uh, their people were sorted that, that day. Um, so what did we do? Um, well, we have not 10 NOMCOM members were selected last summer by random process, um, and uh, we were asked to seat six IESG members, one IOC member, um, a 2015 chair was selected and it was pointed out to me that no, this is some, not something we did, it's something that occurred. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about that there. Um, six IAB members, um, we had 26 NOMCOM telecoms. So this is just, you know, some numbers for you. Um, so very soon it'll be time to, uh, right now it's the lathering part. Uh, we're gonna rinse ourselves off a bit and um, uh, this will repeat again starting sometime in May or June. Um, I thought a lot of people come up to me and said, well, where are we in the NOMCOM cycle? And sometimes I'm like, well, we're right in the middle of it. You could contribute. And sometimes they, I say, well, we're, we, we're done. Oh, except for next month. So I thought it might be interesting to tell people a little bit about what happens. Um, and I made up these phases. They're not in BCP 10, but there's a little bit of stuff there. Um, so this is what happened last year. Um, I was, uh, all and told to do this um, at the end of March last year, um, and I had about six weeks or so to, to figure it out and start the volunteer selection process. So that's the pink bar. Um, let me see if the cursor actually show up there. Yeah, it does a pink bar there. Um, and so that goes on for about approximately eight or nine weeks, uh, which people can volunteer and say, I am willing to serve on the NOMCOM. Following that point, in this gap here, the random selection process occurs, um, and I'm not gonna go into that, um, and 10 people are selected. Um, uh, ideally, prior to the summer ITF meeting, such that we actually can meet them, sit together, generate private keys, a private key to keep track of all of your confidential um, 
comments and um, the volunteers are seated and available. Um, during that period, we get told who we are supposed to be uh, filling, what seats are supposed to be filled. As you know, uh, or may know, uh, but I'm gonna tell you, the ISG asked not to fill the second app area seat. Um, and uh, so we, we didn't. Uh, we go through a process of, of seeking candidates. You will see there's many announcements um, about that. And so that process goes on for, for about, about eight or 10 weeks, depending on how you count. Um, and in particular, if the committee feels that we, we don't have enough options for a particular uh, position, um, we, we have, and previous NOMCOMs have done this, um, I've basically gone back to the community and say, um, is there anyone else available? We are looking for more people. So that's a little bit uh, not a well-defined endpoint. Um, we tend to interview candidates in person at the third meeting of the year, which is usually in November. Um, I just want to point out the next three November meetings will be in Asia, according to Tobias. So just something to think about. Um, if you are a candidate or you want feedback that you will need to make sure that probably that you can get there. Um, we did have visa problems with candidates attending Honolulu. I sure hope they're all gone. And I'm curious to know of con conflicts or, con uh, or constraints that will keep people from traveling to Seoul or Yokohama or this kind of stuff. Whatever they are, I think that we need to figure that out well in advance. Um, so where were we were? Phase six this is the cyan colored thing. Essentially, we start re reading candidates' questionnaires um, and all the information that comes to them the moment they put their hand up or are nominated. Um, and so we have a process that goes through, and this is a confidential process. I mentioned 29 telecons, um, one or two a week uh, for one or two hours, and um, that goes on essentially. My goal was that I wasn't gonna work on this over Christmas break, so it had to be done by then. Um, and uh, finally we get into phase seven, and this is sometimes a, a surprising long thing. So if you read BCP 10, you'll learn that the nominations committee makes recommendations to a confirming body. Confirming body for the IESG is the IAB. Confirming body for the IAB is the IAOC. Um, the confirming, excuse me, it's the ISOC board, not the IAOC. Um, the confirming body for the IAOC appointee um, is actually the IESG, okay? Um, so one of the constraints turns out that they have to have a meeting and if they don't have a meeting scheduled, we can't get a confirmation. So that's, that's actually a, a long kind of dead time and we need to make sure that we get our job done in a timely fashion that interlocks with their meeting schedule so that it actually uh, people can be announced because we can't really announce it as someone who hasn't confirmed, been confirmed yet. So that's why I also have a big long yellow part announcing results. It, it actually spread over quite a few weeks this year. Um, and then finally, phase nine is there's transition. That's not us. We're not involved. That's that's the new candidates. That's, you know, whatever. So if you went to a working group session and you saw an unusually large number of area directors there, that's probably because they were ones that were coming in and ones that were going out. Um, finally, this NOMCOM is responsible uh, for filling any vacancies that occur essentially until the phase three of the next NOMCOM is, occurs. Let me do next phase, we make the go click, no, no. Um, a major problem that we had, as I mentioned in November, um, was that you send us comments, they go into our system and at itf.org and it relays them using a, as simple as processing possible and, and great reason is to make it, uh, the emails as confidential as possible, not to be stored. Um, at least a couple of members of the NOMCOM were initially unable to receive these messages because they were marked as spam, okay? Um, because the sender had marked, said DMARC reject, and that is a great, uh, is a common thing for most commodity email providers out there. And they were at another commodity email provider that was processing it, okay? So it's one thing to say, okay, I'm at, you know, xyz.com, okay? 
and I could call up my, you know, IT guy and maybe have them fix it. Um, so the usual answer is, oh, forget that. You'll just go get a Gmail or Yahoo account. Well, that actually made it worse, not better. Okay. Um, secondly, um, a number of these providers are simply inaccessible to people behind a various country firewalls. Um, and this was an issue, um, uh, which, you know, we saw through trial and error. Um, we might need to provide them with ietf.org mailboxes accessible by POP3S or IMAPS or whatever, um, except we may be forced to drop the S because someone may want to watch their traffic or not let them access it. So that's even a more interesting problem, all right? Um, will we be forced to do that or will we say no? That's a question for this, this community. I consider doing this an admission of defeat says, look, we can't make SMTP work on the, on the wild internet. We're going to withdraw to our own IETF intranet and give everyone an address. And, uh, you know, that's defeat to me. So I don't know what the answer is. I'm just telling you this is causing real problems within our organization. Forget about what anyone else is doing, okay? Um, other challenges. The uncertainty over the app area. Um, AD um, was people thought it was going to be a big deal. Um, it, the message arrived a little bit late. Um, we had already said we'd like to fill it. We revised that pretty quickly. Um, there were some people uh, that said I would serve, and they may have gone through a process of of asking for management approval. And unfortunately, that you know, was wasted effort. So. My suggestion is if we can find this out prior to the summer IETF, that would be a good idea. One of the, I put this under challenges, I'm sorry, it's not really a challenge. People wondered if adding the third routing AD was going to be a big, big problem or how are we gonna find candidates? Well, fortunately, um, thank you to Adrian who's over there, he made it quite clear that he was not re-upping very early. Um, and this meant that we had actually quite a large number of very high quality candidates um, and this meant that even though we had picked one of them as the second AD, picking a third was relatively easy to do. In fact, my experience was like, woohoo, like we get to pick twice. We don't have to like trade off so much. As a non-voting member, I'm like, this is really cool. I get to, you know, you get to have two popsicles, not one, right? Two flavors, right? That's, isn't that great? Um, kind of thing. So that was something that's not really a challenge, I guess, but it was something that happened. Some of the things that Omcom process is bad at. Um, while we've been variously described as a hiring committee, um, and we're not really that, um, but we act a lot like that, one of the things that a hiring committee usually gets to do in another enterprise is go back and do some kind of performance review, you know, while well, you can still let them go or before they've, you know, sold their house and moved or something like this. Um, but we don't really get to do that until about 18 months into the, into their term. At which point it's really too far, too late to, for them to react or do anything or convince the community that you know they've changed their ways or anything like this, and so that's a really bad thing. I think that we should have some mechanism, and I don't have any particular good idea what. Some mechanism to say, hey, your style, your this, your what, you know, uh, is not really conducive to how the community is working, and to to say perhaps in a publicly acknowledged way hey, I'm bad at this, I'm trying to change, can you help me, remind me whenever I do something uh, uh, that's, that's not very nice to people, okay, to help me get better at it. Um, so I don't know what the answer is, but the non is a really bad way to do this, is what I'm trying to tell you. Um, 2014, so 2000, uh, I was happened to have been randomly selected to be on the non in 2013, so I was painfully aware that we needed a chair for the next year. Um, and uh, we also had a, a, a change. Kathy has joined us at the beginning, I think, of 2014. And so there was actually some question of, you know, would, would NOMCOM chair be selected or would she get lost in bureaucracy of trying something? So um, in this case, it wasn't particularly urgent because I was familiar with how, with how NOMCOM worked. Um, we did push to, to get her to appoint um, the 2015 NOMCOM chair earlier but it didn't formally happen in time for that new person, which is Harold Alphastrad, um, to join us in November to learn how things worked. 
So he did in fact join us uh, to participate to select the third area director and uh, that I think is very good but the goal is to have the 2016 chair selected before the November 2015 interviews occur so that the new chair it basically can be trained uh, in what's going on and can feel confident going into the next year that they have a good idea what's going what what uh, they need to do Summary of the non-com results. Um, I was asked to change the italics to colors, but I didn't do that because I was having a nap at lunch instead of doing that. Um, so the ones in italics that you may not be able to read are the new people. Um, and uh, But that's the list I've been asked. Uh, Non-com chairs have been asked repeatedly to not just show the new people, but show the entire content of the committee because people like to know the whole, the whole bit. So um, uh, there you go, that's who's up. Uh, who's there and which places and when they uh, arrived. I don't know why it says Kathy Brown 2014, that's a typo. Um, my slide with the list of the NOMCOM disappeared, didn't it? Oh. Well, I was gonna tell you who was on the NOMCOM, but and there was a slide, but it's disappeared. It's gone away. Did you delete it? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I ask those of the NOMCOM who are in the room to stand up so that they can be seen and and uh, I went hoping to give them a round of applause. And there you go. So I'm I'm very thankful to them. They did a really good job, and they they worked really really hard. Um, and uh, a volunteer in May and June. Um, it's fun. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Kathleen and Lisandra. Hi, so Lissandra and I will give an overview of Code Match. I'll go through a brief um, review of what it is, and Lissandra will go through the fun stuff, the mock-ups and um, uh, prototype. So what is Code Match? It is a, I'm sorry, the flashes are distracting. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> Code Match is a collaborative or will be a collaborative site to connect open source to standards. And it's meant to bring together students, researchers, professors, open source development communities, vendors of proprietary implementations, and consumers of code bases. So I think the easiest way to describe it is through an example. So let's say you have a draft that you'd like to see implemented. You would come up with a description of it and figure out about how much time you think it's going to take to code this draft. And then you would say, okay, I'm willing to be a mentor to anyone that would like to code this draft. So you'd go to the code match site and you'd enter this information, connect it back to the data tracker, and um, this would let other people decide that they would like to code to this draft and create a link from their projects. And their project could be an open source project and it might be an open source community, it could be a student that says, oh, this is one that I can do as a senior project or it could be a uh, proprietary implementation, and it might be a link to a description of a product where it's implemented in. But the important part is that you'll have the contact information all connected to that one draft and understand how many implementations there are through Code Match, just linking it. So Code Match won't post code. Um, let's see, so uh, another uh, important point just from this slide, I'm, I'm not gonna read slides, I'm gonna try to go through this really quickly is the Grace Hopper celebration, and that's where the idea for this originated. So I worked at, I, at the Grace Hopper celebration with ISOC in uh, October 2013, and we got to talk to 200 students at least and a number of professors, and it became very clear they didn't know what the IETF was. So we were trying to think of ways to connect them into the IETF. So the, the original idea was much smaller than what it is now, and it was really just a way for students to get introduced to the IETF that they could, for a senior project or something, code 
something that fits their timeline and then get some obvious benefits out of that in that they might have code that would be used again. It may not be throwaway code like they might have done for projects. Um, they may get to participate in a plug fest and have some good things for the resume, improve standards, and all the while get exposed to the IETF. So it came out of some of the diversity efforts. And let's see, so for the goals, I'm only gonna hit on one here, which is increase collaboration with underrepresented communities. And this is an important one because the, we have a few team members from Latin America who are very interested to get this running in advance of Buenos Aires so that they could engage folks through this and have them coding drafts prior to that meeting so when they come, they feel like they can participate in some way uh, as a low barrier entry point to the IETF. So one of the focuses for the team was to make sure that there was benefits to all participants. I'm not gonna read through these benefits, but for each type of person that might be interested in this site from that list I read off before, there are clear benefits to them and we've documented them, just a few of them here and some on our website placeholder for when this does go live, which is just codematch.ietf.org. And so we'll be able to do things like demonstrate multiple interoperable implementations and have measurable way to show how we're doing with standards and running code. So our roadmap uh, from October 23, or 2013, sorry, uh, we had the idea started and then expanded with contributions from all the team members and I think some folks on the IETF list. And from that and the planning, mock-ups were developed and Lissandro led, led that. And we worked a bit on the data model and making sure that we were using the data tracker, using authentication with, within those considerations. And a prototype was developed, you'll see that shortly. And at this meeting, a few of you may have participated in user interface testing on Sunday. So we'll be taking that feedback in. We thank you for doing that. And we'll rev the prototype and hope to begin development. Development, we have in three phases right now. And we haven't really broken out by features, not a project plan per se, because this is volunteer driven. So phase one will be the basic functionality where you could um, create code matches, which might be to an existing RFC and code that you wrote 10 years ago, and that would not require a code request. And then you'd also be able to post code requests and create the matches that involve a mentor that might be willing to uh, mentor folks who decide to write code to that. And then phase two, we'll move on to some improved functionality. Um, maybe be able to help working groups organize plug fests through this site and a few other things that we've discussed. And phase three would be some more advanced features. Um, and the presentation has a link to our Google Docs where we're maintaining just a feature list. So you're welcome to take a look at that. And I'm gonna pass off now to Lissandro for mock-ups. Well, uh, I'm gonna show you some mockups and also uh, some snapshots of uh, the first version of our prototype. Uh, imagine that uh, here we have a visitor. So the, the visitor will be interested in checking which are the projects associated to some specifications that's gonna be presented on code matches. The second option is code requests. This will list the specifications that need some development. And finally, Coders Hall of Fame, which is an area where we intend to uh, properly list who are the best coders or most prominent ones. So if we go there as a visitor and we click here, we're gonna uh, see something like that. Please ignore the names, they are just mockups, of course. Uh, then we can see a list of projects uh, that are under development. Uh, for each project, we see a name and uh, who's the coder responsible for it, a uh, short description. Then we can also access the original code request, then protocol area, working group, and so on. We can also order the projects based on coder, code requests, and so on. So if going back, the visitor clicks on code requests. You're gonna see this one, in this case, Code requests are a list of specifications that need some coding. In this case, this, uh, this example show 
shows that uh, they are organized by a protocol. And for each protocol, we can see here a list of uh, different uh, requests. So for each of them, we also see a short description and then the projects associated to these uh, co specific code requests. In this case, we have smart probes and uh, man PHP. Also, the, the user interested in coding for this request, he or she can click over here, associate my project, so he will be associated to this code request. Another option is to click again here, and then we'll see some uh, additional information, like a, a longer description and a list of resources. An important uh, point here is the fact that we see the mentor who is responsible uh, for helping the, the developers to achieve their uh, coding projects. Uh, if the developer clicks on associate my projects, in this case, because he or she is not logged in, so we have an notification over here. Also, as a coder, one can see the list of uh, code matches that uh, the, that person is associated with, and we uh, can access specific uh, projects for each project we can also see a description and then a list of resources it's important to mention that this list of resources is uh, it's open so the developer will include uh, things that uh, he or she believes to be important and we can also have some uh, social containers to link this uh, uh, these projects with uh, social media and finally uh, if the person visiting the site is uh, a mentor itself now we can see a list of uh, uh, code requests that a person is mentoring, okay? This is a the data model. I'm not going into the detail, but believe it's uh, okay, but uh, certainly uh, we can improve it. Uh, and these are the uh, current uh, uh, prototype. It's just a prototype, it's not a system itself, so we are dealing with the uh, graphical user interface of it. This mimics the, the somehow the mockups that I have presented before. In this case, we have the dashboard where we can see the number, for example, of requests active and the number of projects, the number of matches and so on. And if the user clicks over here, we can see for the my code matches, how are the, the projects being developed uh, along my uh, original plan. Uh, this uh, uh, mockup, uh, this uh, prototype has been designed so that uh, it could be used in mobile uh, devices as well. So this is just a snapshot in a specific uh, mobile phone. Again, please ignore the names, it's just mockups. Okay, so we want to thank all of our contributors. Um, so a lot of people have been helping on this with comments, feedback, or uh, with the data model, development, code, um, uh, the prototype and uh, the mock-ups. So thank you. And we have a few asks. So if working groups and individuals could think about drafts that could be a good fit for this, that would be great. And we'll, you know, once we're ready to go live, it would be really good to have some data to populate it with. And we'd also like to request assistance from some folks in apps. So if you have the skill sets to understand international considerations for picking icons, we need some help. Um, <laughs> and let's see, timeline is fluid, so this depends on volunteers, so please consider assisting on this project. If you'd like to help, please subscribe to the mailing list and let us know that you're there, and we'll be meeting tomorrow the information about that meeting is posted on the mailing list. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you, and Charles.
a little too short. Okay. Uh, great. Well, sorry about that little uh, hiccup at the start, but uh, my name's Charles Eckel. Very happy to be here and uh, to get to tell you a bit more about uh, the hackathon we had. And um, actually, it was the first ever IETF hackathon, and uh, I think it went quite well, but um, let me share a bit more about it with you. So the idea to have a hackathon, I think it really followed out of a, uh, a talk that um, uh, Dave Ward gave at the last IETF about open source and uh, open standards. And, um, you know, the concept or the idea of having a hackathon followed from that. Um, I'd say one of the really important things we were hoping to do with this hackathon was to advance the, the pace and relevance of the IETF. And um, within the IETF, there's, we're all quite familiar with, with the motto. Um, included in that motto is a rough consensus and, and running code. And the unfortunate reality is, at least in, in my experience in the IETF, is that there's been much more time and emphasis and really the scale's been tipping more towards the um, the rough consensus part and less on running code. And so this was really an attempt to, to try to reestablish that balance. And, and I'm happy to see other attempts in, in that area as well. So, you know, one of the thoughts being that uh, by coming to the hackathon, working on some code, we, we can flush out some ideas. Um, rather than just writing about them in drafts, we can actually implement some code to back them up. And then we can feed that back into the working groups or into BOFs that are happening. And uh, we can create reference implementations and uh, utilities that make it easier for you to use, say, a, a protocol that's either defined or being defined. So you can play with it, um, use it, find bugs with it, so we can fix it, that type of thing. Um, another important thing, though, is that we, we want to attract developers into the IETF. And that's a great way to bring more running code into the IETF, bring more developers in, into the IETF and bring young people into the IETF, people who um, might be a little hesitant to join, but they see an opportunity to code, they're, they're into that, um, but that might bring them in. The, um, within the open source community, we're seeing a lot of, um, there's a lot of speed, energy, excitement around uh, open source, around coding, and so to be able to harness some of that, bring it into the IETF. And uh, you know, there is cool shit in the IETF. And I think we want to make sure that uh, people know that if they come here, experience a hackathon, they work with us, uh, they stick around maybe for some of the meetings. I think that they'll like a lot of what they see, they'll see and uh, that might uh, attract them. Whereas just the thought of, oh yeah, we work on standards, that might not be so exciting to them. So, so what did we do at, at the hackathon? Well, here I list the, uh, the technologies that we worked on um, most of these should look familiar to you, hopefully. It's, uh, some of them are existing working groups. Some are um, proposed working groups that we're having BOFs, say, uh, at this IETF. Um, there's some open source uh, projects listed there. And um, the way we arrived at this list was really just based on volunteers. Yeah. I looked for, for champions who were willing to put together just a, a brief um, overview of, of the technology, describe in say five, 10 minutes what it is, come up with some suggested sample projects that people could work on and, and present that to uh, the attendees at the hackathon. And then also, of course, to um, mentor people a bit, get them up to speed with the technology, answer questions, kind of just be there to help people get started. And then when they're not doing that, they're, uh, the champions are, of course, of course um, free to uh, work on projects as well. So, uh, so the results, I, I think it was, um, the results were, were very, very good. Uh, we had 48 participants and uh, that was despite uh, 
announcing the, the hackathon quite late because it was only late that we decided to, to get this thing going. And uh, those 48 participants, for any, anyone who was in the room can tell you or those who dropped by, I mean, they were really, really engaged. Everyone got involved in a project. Um, no one left, no one got discouraged. Um, Maybe a telling thing. We had, um, we actually had really good food at the hackathon, and uh, that's the reason maybe you should come next time. But, uh, but, but you know, lunch got brought in, and the guys were setting it up, and they they got all this you know beautiful spread of food set up, and and it just sat there, and, and like a half hour goes by, and it it's still just sitting there. You know, no one touched it. They were so engrossed in what they were doing. Finally, I got up and I told people, hey, you know that there's lunch over there and it looks pretty good. And then finally, people started kind of trickling over there when it was convenient, but they really wanted to keep doing what they were doing. Um, and then even that afternoon, right, they brought in the you know, big old cookies. Those just sat there. I, I've been coming to IETF meetings for several years. I've never seen cookies just sit there. <laughs> yeah. Normally, if you don't move fast, they're gone. So. So, I mean, people really were um, excited what they were doing. And I think everyone felt that they learned something. I, I listed here, um, not, not only were we having a, a good time where people excited about it, but we had some real um, accomplishments. Um, I, I list them here. I'll just try to go through them. Uh, rather than go through them all um, individually, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just say that, you know, we did things like, uh, you know, cross um, – working group type activities like beer powered home net routing, uh, which really probably wouldn't have happened if you hadn't got, you know, just these different people in, in the room at the same time. We, we had some new open source projects created, new contributors brought on to them, some existing open source projects. We had um, first time contributors contribute to them. We had some um, uh, working group drafts like the SFC trace route draft and the SPUD prototype draft, those actually got implemented and uh, like bugs found in the draft, fixed in the draft, information fed back into working group sessions and BOFs. Um, so really just a lot of very useful work that I think we really did make a difference. I think we really did help um, advance the, the speed um, of some of the things going on within the IETF. <coughs> And, um, oh, and I certainly want to say uh, uh, thanks um, to Yari to uh, giving us the chance to do this. I think uh, Yari was one of the, uh, the initial believers in, in the idea. And uh, to the whole AMS staff, I mean, um, um, Stephanie and, and Marsha and Alexa, that they were a huge help and I'm sure a bunch of others that, that I'm forgetting to mention, but uh, they really helped pull this off in, in a very short time frame and, and help make it a great event. And uh, as, as Yari announced, I'm, I'm very happy that you know, we'll get to do it again in Prague and, and bigger and better. And, and to, that, um, to that end, making it bigger and better, this was the first one. Uh, I know there were a lot of things we did wrong. I know there's a lot of people in here with great ideas about how we can do it better in the future. So I'd really like to hear all of that. Um, I'll stick around for a bit after the plenary. And um, you know, maybe we also have the 92 Hackathon uh, mailer that we used for communicating during the hackathon. I encourage you to sign up now. We can exchange ideas there, and if it makes sense, we can even do something, uh, you know, maybe meet in the bar or something before uh, bits and bites um, tomorrow if people have time. So um, uh, that's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, Cisco, for uh, sponsoring this. This um, really was a good thing. I, I, I spent some time there. I was unable to be there the whole time, um, but but it really felt felt like it, it's a, everyone there had a good vibe. So that's um, a good thing. And uh, Kathy, I think you're next.
Thank you, Yari. Uh, it's my uh, it's my privilege to announce today the opening of the nominations for the 2015 Jonathan B. Postel Service Award. Uh, as many of you know, and all of you know, uh, the award uh, recognizes the uh, the extraordinary work uh, that John did over the course of a 30-year career. Uh, he served as the editor, the first editor of the RFC series of notes from its inception in 1969 until 1998. He also served uh, as the ARPANET number czar and internet assigned numbers authority over the same period of time. He was a founding member of the IAB and the first individual member of the Internet Society for which he also served as a trustee. Uh, this is a list of um, the very esteemed uh, honorees uh, that have come before. I think one of the most wonderful moments I spent last year was when Mahabir Poon finished his kind of amazing slide deck showing how he sort of uh, took the equipment to build the internet in the Himalayas up the mountain on, on horseback. And this assembly stood and cheered and that was, it was an amazing moment. And so I look forward to another one of those um, as we open these nominations. Uh, they will be accepted from the 25th today of March uh, till May 15th. The criteria. Uh, the award was established by the Internet Society to honor a person or an organization which has made outstanding contributions in service to the data communications community, including sustained and substantial technical contributions, service to the community, uh, leadership. Uh, with respect to leadership, the award committee places particular emphasis on candidates who support and enable others in addition to their own specific actions. The uh, website is here. Uh, you can nominate folks. Please participate in this enormously important uh, award. It will be, the award honoree will be announced uh, at IETF 93 in Prague. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking of Prague, Andre. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have a very difficult task, you know. Uh, I would like, on behalf of Brocade and Cezidnik, invite you to Prague. And, and I would like to see something about Prague you don't know, which is extremely difficult because we are all great and, and frequent travelers. You have been to Prague at least twice. And, and there's probably nothing I can tell you about it. But still, I know there are some newcomers and I know there are some people with a little bit worse memory. So, first of all, Prague is a small country with a huge consumption of beer, actually. Uh, <clears throat> speaking in numbers, we are uh, country number 115 in terms of area and leader in beer consumption per capita, of course. Uh, but guys, here's the thing. We need your help. We have a problem. The competitors, for example, Germany, Belgium, didn't give up. You know, They are still fighting. So we need your help. Please come to Prague and help us. Uh, we need you. In case you, you need some tips for some training facilities, I can offer you, for example, an uh, interesting brewery called Umed Vitku, founded in uh, 14, uh, 1460, a very old brewery before Columbus really decided to invent some new lands. So maybe if he knew this, I don't know what would happen. Oh, another good example, brewery Upleku, uh, founded in 1499, uh, the oldest brewery in Prague, you know, continuously brewing since that time, so it's really an impressive place. If, if you are not a beer fan or if you just want to see something else, well, Prague offers you a lot in terms of um, architecture uh, and arts, so 
Uh, I suggest you to go, for example, from Old Town Square to the uh, Charles Bridge, which is on the picture, and, and then you can climb up to the Prague Castle. By the way, according to Guinness Book, this is the largest ancient castle in the world, so it's definitely worth to see. And you can end up, for example, in, in a very small street called Golden Lane Street, where you can, of course, uh, drink, for example, a golden lager, because after such a long uh, trip, you will definitely deserve it. Um, so you have been to Prague many times, so you, you are really fed up of, of all the historical sites and architecture. Uh, so what about to try to see Prague from the underground? And I'm not talking about the underground transportation system, which is, by the way, very clean, absolutely reliable, regular, and absolutely safe. But what about to go to, to Bubenech uh, sewage plant? You know, it's uh, it's great experience. You go underground, you listen stories from funny guides, and, and you can soak up the atmosphere of the Prague underground. No, it's not stinky, actually, no. Uh, Czech food, interesting chapter, Czech cuisine. Uh, for example, what I would suggest you to go to a, a pub called Local, uh, because even locals go there. And uh, what you can get there is, is the original Czech food. Uh, for example, Olomouc cheese. Uh, I, I, I bet you will remember how, how it smells, really. It's something strange. And, but definitely you will like the taste afterwards if you will try to taste it. Or you can, for example, try a goulash with dumplings. The local says that this is the best ally in your fights against hangovers, so really try it. Uh, oh, another, and this is one of the better examples of communist cuisine, fried cheese. It's definitely something it's worth to try. And last but not least, the national, national dish, which is, uh, which is pork with dumplings and sauerkraut. As, as you can see, the Czech cuisine is definitely not healthy. Definitely you would like to eat when you are on diet, but perfectly matches the beer, actually. If you're early, early bird, that's great, because uh, unlike the rest of the country, Prague citizens are not early birds. So if you can see some unique atmosphere, uh, go in the morning, walk, walk in the Prague streets. If you are a movie fan, even better. Uh, you can, for example, try to find location that where uh, Amadeus, a uh, film awarded by eight Oscars and directed by, by uh, Czech director Miloš Forman was shot. Or uh, if you are more action movie fan, you can uh, you can see places where, for example, uh, Hellboy, uh, Mission Impossible, Casino Royale, and, and many other films were shot. So definitely something uh, worth to see. Um, if we say in Czech Prague, we we have two expressions that that, that actually comes to my mind. We say Prague. The mother of cities, and, and Prague in our know, language is she, it's a lady. Uh, or we say magical Prague. How this, how this started, actually. Uh, try to imagine uh, ancient Prague, second half of 16th century, in Prague Castle on the throne, sitting Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor, King of Bohemia, King of Hungary and Croatia, Archduke of uh, Austria, so very powerful men. And also, you know, a passionate lover of, of science as an artist. So, so that time, he actually invited many great scientists and artists to Prague. Uh, so that, those times, if you would walk up, if you would walk in the, in the Prague streets, you could, for example, meet uh, uh, Rabbi Lev, um, a great Jewish philosopher and, and mystic. Or he was also, also named uh, Judah Lev ben Bezalel, or just the Maharal. Uh, you know, uh, and he, he, you, you could meet him walking and uh, with his artificial being golem, the magical golem, golem of Prague. In the same time, you could, for example, uh, meet uh, English mystic and alchemist Edward Kelly. He, he claimed to possess a secret of uh, transmuting basic metals into gold and also the, the secret is philosopher's stone. And also you could, for example, meet Tycho Brahe, you know, Danish uh, astronomer and personal astrologer of his majesty, Rudolf II. So all those people really sort of laid the, the basis of the, of the special uh, genius loci or, or genius loci, if you wish, uh, of Prague. 
So it's not surprised that later on some, some great men, like for example, Franz Kafka uh, wrote his uh, Metamorphosis and some other books, or that Albert Einstein created some parts of his, of his general relativity theory in Prague as well. So this all makes very unique atmosphere. And they were not just scientists. Um, if you go to a Prague castle in, in its basement, you can see uh, graves of five Holy Roman emperors, you know, the ones of the most powerful people in the medieval Europe. Uh, and some people say Czech language is, is hard. Actually, it's not, honestly. I, I learned before I was able to, to program in C. <laughs> Pretty simple. And more than that, you know some Czech words. Uh, in this country, uh, I think you use a currency called dollar, and you probably don't know that it's from the Czech medieval currency called tolar. Uh, you know the word pistol, which, which comes from the Czech, uh, Czech name for the, for the flute or pipe or something like that. And last but not least, you know, the word robot, invented by, by a Czech painter, Josef Čapek, uh, and he created this word for his brother, who was writing a, a play, uh, R-U-R, uh, and he, he needed some name for artificial beings, so that's how the word robot was created. Actually, it, it means forced labor in, in, the, in the old uh, Czech language, so that's why this, this appeared. So, one practical thing, uh, if you are applying to Prague, uh, if you want to save some money to your company, to your wife's husband's, uh, or if you, you know, understood the depth of my plea and you will bring some, some friends that loves beer, um, you can save some money uh, if, if, you will, uh, if you will use Skype lines because we negotiated 15% discount on flights to Prague. Uh, and uh, all this information and many others you will see on, on our web pages, you know, IETF. 93.cz. So we will, we will see that more, more, more information, more some practical stuff. Uh, and also, if you have some questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask my colleague Daniel, who's sitting there, but he's going to be sitting at the CZNIC's booth uh, to, the, to the end of the week. Uh, you know, his, his, name means, uh, his name is Daniel Rosum, which means uh, wisdom or, or reason or intellect. So he's definitely the best guy to ask, to have some curious question and, and ask him. Uh, so, uh, Please do it. And again, on behalf of Brocade and CZNIC, I wish you a uh, you know, successful meeting, and we are really looking forward to seeing you in Prague. Thank you. Thank you for having us there. Looking forward to coming there. Okay, so next, let me just turn this off. Um, if we can get uh, Adrian Farrell, Pete Resnick, Ted Lemo, and Richard Barnes on stage, please. Um, so you're here um, because I wanted to, of course, congratulate you on your successful escape from the ISG. Um, and not only that, but um, really thank you um, as, as much as I can um, on, on your years of service. Um, there's a lot of things that are um, going on the, in the ISG life or, or your, your tasks. Um, it's not just the things that you see here in, during the meetings or the documents to get approved, but um, there really is a lot of work um, in this position, and, and it's a volunteer task. These people have taken time uh, from their day jobs to come and do this uh, for the benefit of the ITF, for the benefit of the internet. And um, I really can't thank you enough for, for doing that. And I really uh, uh, very much appreciated working with you all and uh, looking to see you around in, in other things um, in the future. And um, thank you. And I, I did want to hand the pack. Uh, why don't we start from Adrian? Oh, and now we have a plaque. 
for you, and not for the unicorn. But. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So hopefully the unicorn is not happening. <laughs> Pete? Keep the animal, but return the back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And um, could I also ask uh, for Randy Bush, Bob Hinden, and Russ Housley to come uh, to the stage, please? So um, as Ray mentioned before, um, these three served for a long time at the IAOC. The IOC is a quite silent body of the IETF, more looking after the rather boring numbers and budgets and uh, little projects here and there, but uh, equally, I think, a very important backbone. And it was a pleasure serving with you and learning from you uh, in, over the last years. Um, so where is, where is Randy? OK, maybe he's too yeah. tired. He ran oh, okay, away. he's he's potentially yeah. Okay, so then uh, where's the Randy rack? had an appointment that he uh, oh okay so he had to leave. So then we have to give it to him later. Uh, where is the rack? So, uh, let's start with uh, Bob. Maybe is that okay? Yeah. Which side do you prefer, right or left? You know, it's a little bit unfair, uh, kind of the IOC, maybe it's more looking for budgets and I don't have any animals, so I hope you could <laughs> You could also say I'm lacking imagination. That might be that. Okay, Russ, uh, we try this side, maybe? Okay. Okay, so. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Russ and Bob and Randy for your services at the IOC. That's highly appreciated. Thank you.
I, I think it's time for, for the IOC open mic, so um, we, we can do a replacement of people here, and um, the, the uh, IESG people can come back um, a little bit later um, for, for our open mic session. Do we have a slide for that? No. So would the IOC members and trust trustees please come to the stage? Yeah. So I just want to add one thing, which is that you know if there's any questions relating to the other presentations, not to the IAS, ISG or IAOC or trust stuff, then you can ask those things too, and maybe maybe the presenters can um, come to the microphone or something. Um, so, so you feel free to ask about any of these topics um, or the IAC topics. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to invite your attention to the screen over here on the side. Um, we are running an experiment with Meet Echo this week, having to do with allowing remote participants to more greatly participate in the uh, in the meetings. And so we have this uh, remote mic queue this virtual queue, and so you may see little uh, Pac-Man folks coming across the screen uh, if they're ready to uh, comment or have any questions. Um, so on behalf of the IEOC and the IETF Trust, uh, I'd like to invite you for any questions or comments you would like to raise in regards to the administration. Oh, yeah, introduce. Okay, so you see I, I do this the first time. So let's start on the left. Uh, Andrew Sullivan from the IAB. Benson Schleser, appointed by the IAB. Oh. Kathy Brown, Internet Society. Um, Bob Hinden, outgoing. Tobias Gondrom, uh, appointed by the IESG, I believe, <laughs> last year. Yare Ako, IETF Chair. Russ Housley, outgoing IB Chair. Ray Pelletier, IED. Blue Berger, appointed by NOMCOM. Scott Bradner, appointed by ISOC board. Okay, thank you very much, and sorry that I nearly skipped this step. Uh, so please feel free to come to the mics or to join our virtual mic queue. Um, and we go for the first one. Yeah, I'm John Levine. I'm not sure who the right person is to ask, because if there's so many of you here, maybe one of you. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a fairly big splash about the Open Internet Endowment, which I believe was intended to provide permanent funding for the ITF, and a bunch of us gave small amounts of money, and, and what, happened? what happened? Where is it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay. <laughs> um, the endowment was established in 2011, and there were, was some, uh, some contribution to the endowment around that time in about 2012. Uh, because I really think about the change of leadership at, uh, at ISOC and uh, just the way life goes, uh, it has stood at about mm, 80, not much. In, that money sits <laughs> in the account. We're about now to, and I'm glad you raised this today, we're about now to uh, open this drive up again to see if we can't get some uh, donors uh, to this uh, endowment. One of the issues that has been raised with a number of folks who would like to donate uh, is the purpose statement that is in the uh, policy that was passed by the Internet Society. The purpose as it now states the endowment is for the IETF and other open standards uh, activities or organizations, something like that. There was a concern uh, amongst folks who would like to go ahead and contribute again, that it be clear that the endowment is for the use of the IETF. And so we have just started a conversation actually uh, among the members of the board of ISOC about whether we shouldn't uh, revise that purpose statement so that it is clear that the endowment is for the exclusive use of the IETF and uh, its activities. Uh, that draft is actually being socialized even this week about the sense of the community around that. I spoke to the IOC about it just this morning. 
And so um, we, we want to go forward with this. I think I'll let Bob speak, but I think there is um, um, some um, appreciation on the part of the board that this might be a good way to go. And uh, we will then reopen the campaign. So your contribution is safely in an account, and we hope to um, we hope to have others now start to contribute. Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly fine with me. Speaking as one of your many tiny daughters, you know, if you if you make, if you made that change to the to, to, to the endowment, although I think you need to, you need to tell us. But my, my other question is, I presume the, the goal was the plan was to go and. Go shake some of the usual big gorillas and look for large contributions. That's exactly right. Yeah, is, are there you know are there way, ways that you would like to, like us to help you shake? Since yes, yeah. I would. If, I think we if we can get this cleared up, and, and I think we will in the next couple of weeks and get this underway. I think there are some donors who are interested. I'm hoping I'm seeing some indication of this. And once we start to get that rolling, I'd like to actually enlist your help both to see if we can get some folks who have um, some substantial funds to see if they won't support the ongoing sustainability of the IETF, which is the purpose. Um, our goal would be to uh, have a corpus large enough so that the interest uh, that is generated actually helps the yearly expenses that are actually sort of ticking up, notwithstanding uh, this year they stayed I think through good management, uh, pretty steady. So uh, we will come back to you for some help to think about who are sources of funding. And then actually to think about with all of you whether there's an individual uh, kind of donation uh, giving kind of campaign that we would want to start. So I, uh, stay tuned. I think we can get this uh, sort of lined up in the next uh, month or two. Okay. Thank you for asking. Thank you for your question. Um, can I invite any further questions? Yes, please. State your name for the mic. Yes. Hi, Paul Martins. Uh, a question came up during the hackathon, whether IHF could actually own code. <laughs> That's what the <laughs> IETF trust is for. OK, uh, well, yeah, I'll let go Yari first. Yeah, yeah. So um, we could talk about multiple things there. I mean, the the role and opinion of IETF is is just one of them. Um, but you know, maybe a more relevant question is that if you all work in various different projects, open source projects, those projects will have it, their own rules, and it might be counterproductive for us to have you know a, a um, our own re regime regarding those rules. Uh, because then it w might make it more difficult for you to contribute to, say, Linux kernel or whatever it is that you're doing. So I think that's the first question to think about. What is it that would work for you? And, and only after we know that, that, then we could see how can the ITF help there. So I, I think that's one of the things that Charles mentioned we, we should discuss on the list. Let's discuss that on the um, hackathon list and, and you know, um, on the way towards Prague. Um, and what, what could we... What could we do that, um, or what, what, what is it that we would actually like to have as participants um, in terms of um, uh, uh, code ownership and IPR rules and such uh, for that part? But to answer your theoretical question, the IETF Trust already has code. The code that's been developed under contract uh, from the IETF is, in, is, is owned by the Trust. So in theory, in theory the, the IETF as in the IETF trust, can own code. The question is whether we need to own more code. Okay. Please, next. Uh, Michael Richardson. Um, so I'm really pleased that we had very little visa problems for this IETF. Um, I'm concerned that we don't know why. Um, it could just be an anomaly. Um, it would be very nice if we could find out why. Um, I have heard speculation that business visas to Hawaii are suspicious. Uh, I guess they aren't suspicious to Dallas because no one comes here for pleasure or something. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. At least we didn't get flooded this time, right? Think about it that way. Um, that was fun. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so um, uh, we have Japan, Korea, Prague, Buenos Aires, Unknown Asia, 
uh, coming up. And I, I think we maybe should have some more collected single place of, of advice on visa and this kind of stuff. And particularly if there are uh, advanced lines. I know there's lots of issues in with China and we had a lot of discussion in the leading up to the to the to uh, the Beijing meeting as to you know what was wet and how and you can't get your visa too early don't get it too late and all sorts of other stuff like that so I I think that we would benefit from um, having not us all go run around and find it at all I know it applies to different countries in different ways um, but uh, I think it would be really useful if we could uh, make sure that we know what's going on uh, well in advance of even people thinking about whether or not I'm going to try and organize a boff at a particular time. Because if it turns out you can't get your pe the people there in the meeting room, then you might want to do it earlier, right? You might want to rush and do something in Prague rather than in Yokohama um, that, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, thanks. So let, let me try to answer to one or two of your questions. So I believe, uh, and, and Ray may be able to correct me, I believe we had some anecdotal evidence that um, the timing of uh, Honolulu in the fall was coinciding with mm -hmm. a certain student rush uh, of, of more student applying for their visa, which uh, put a lot of pressure on the US uh, visa system. and. Um, Another change that seems to be uh, to now is that the U.S. government has extended the, the lifetime of the visas they are issuing. So uh, it seems that these two mechanisms uh, mean that we basically didn't see any significant troubles now. Um, to be clear, in the IOC meeting, um, visa concerns are a serious concern for us. So if you are having troubles with a visa, we want to know about it. And uh, also in Honolulu, the moment we heard about it, uh, we took uh, great lengths to make sure that everybody, that we could help you as much as possible and that everybody could come. So I mean, the, the, we, we did reach out to political channels and so on to make sure that we do our best. So if you encounter troubles, please let us know and we will do our best to support you. I guess just to follow up on that a little bit, and that is that uh, we are opening up registrations earlier. Uh, there's no reason not to in many cases um, uh, so that people can get their letters of invitation. Uh, but there are restrictions for, for country to country with regard to how early you can apply, and that might make it a little more difficult. But um, And uh, we're also publishing and supporting efforts uh, uh, going to the Department of State, for example, in the U.S. when we needed to for Honolulu. Next, uh, please. Keith Moore, I'm just wondering if it's worth trying to have some sort of uh, regular um, means of collecting data on how many people uh, are successful or unsuccessful at obtaining visas, uh, perhaps on the registration page or something. Because if you say, please contact us, I think that doesn't give you as reliable a sense of how well things are working. Yeah. So I, I believe we actually even followed up uh, asking proactively um, some of the people who asked us for invitations, let, invitation letters with whether there was any uh, problems. Because usually you need an invitation letter for a visa. But maybe Ray wants to give more information yeah, on that. More, more specifically, um, last uh, for Honolulu, just a couple of weeks or so before the uh, the deadline of coming to the meeting, uh, we became aware of the that there were uh, backlogs, there were issues and things. And uh, through Vin's help, uh, we found the appropriate contact at the Department of State who intervened. And we actually sent an email to every registrant from China asking for the appropriate information by which we could then um, make things happen. And we, I received 36 responses, and we got about 30 folks into the, into, at the meeting. Now, for Dallas, about three weeks ago, I noticed that uh, there was a high registration number, but only 21 folks had paid or even said they were coming. And so I'm concerned. I sent an email to all 135 plus and said, yeah, are you having visa issues? If you are, this is the information that I need. 
and I was going to activate the Department of State. Only two people responded, and uh, their issue was they weren't getting in, having a um, an interview until like March 14th, March 22nd. A little hard to turn that one around, but uh, so it it seems like that we're getting the numbers. Now, what we're seeing in China has been the issue coming in the United States, just these two. Looking back, um, what we're seeing are 65 to 80 from China, and we're pretty much hitting those numbers each time. So I think things are improving, and I think people are getting more uh, longer visa um, uh, options a, a year, that kind of a thing, a multi-meeting uh, a visa. So things appear to be improving, but we are going to post on the website links to the embassies and the information that you need uh, as well, as early as we can. Yeah, I think one of the things I wonder sometimes is when attendance is dropping, what's the reason? And, and visas strike me as one, particularly if there's a perception that it's hard to travel to the U.S. Maybe people don't even try. But uh, anything, I'd say anything you can do to try to track it, whether it's via tracking the invitation letters or something would be beneficial. Thank you. Thank you for your question and your feedback. Any, any other questions or comments you want to raise? Okay, I see no one at the mic, so uh, I think with this I can close the open session. Thank you. Open session for the IOC. There's still one more, um, the IEC, if I can get both the incoming and outgoing IEC members here on stage with your stuffed animals, if you have any. And they're continuing to. Okay. So why don't we do introductions, starting from the right. Hello, I'm Benoit, and I'm the Ops AD. Aliyah Atlas, Routing AD. Martin Stimmerling, Transport AD. Joel Yegley, Operations and Management. Depot Brungard, Incoming Routing Area. Adrian Farrell, Outgoing Routing and Unicorn Wrangler. Russ Housley, Outgoing IAV Chair. Pete Resnick. <laughs> outgoing APSI. All right. With, Thank you. With, with a closed weirds working group. Mm -hmm. Excellent. <laughs> and Yari Arkwaitiv chair. Barry Liba, remaining and for now lonely absating. <laughs> Somebody get that man some friends. Lonely. Spencer Dawkins, welcoming you to Texas Transport AD. <laughs> Steve Farrell. Kathleen Moriarty, security. Ben Campbell, incoming right. Andrew Sullivan, incoming IAB chair. Alvaro Rotana, incoming routing. Richard Barnes, outgoing right. Poop, you're up. Poop, you're up. Alyssa Cooper, continue. <laughs> Perfect. 
Ryan Haberman, Internet. <laughs> Ted Lemon, outgoing Internet. Terry Mendison, incoming Internet area. Okay, we're ready for a question. Dave Crocker. Stop, because it turns out there's no Q&A time for your uh, non-com session. And um, you raised a really interesting point about giving review feedback earlier to uh, people NOMCOM has selected. I've been on a number of uh, NOMCOMs where we ended up doing this de facto, even though it wasn't the official job. And my own reaction was, NOMCOM is the only group that goes around and gets feedback from people about the, the performance of those who are up for review that year, but also it turns out can't help but get it for people who are not up for review. Then I was even on one NOMCOM where we tried to use that feedback. Um, I think it would be um, perfectly reasonable and not require any formal changes in anything for NOMCOMs to simply take the process of using that and providing it in some um, constructive fashion uh, as perfectly reasonable task. That's just a thought. It's not actually why I got up here, but since you walked by, I thought I'd uh, raise it for the community. <laughs> Reason I got up was um, actually an announcement some of you have already seen, um, and it's relevant to uh, the IESG. Uh, there was a, uh, an internet draft that circulated um, uh, talking about the role of a working group secretary. And there was uh, some very vigorous discussion about this, which concluded that it said useful things, but was not the right document. And that prompted a discussion between Ralph Drums and me, and uh, we started uh, then the task of uh, trying to revise the working group guidelines uh, uh, RFC. Um, a version of that is now available in the Internet Draft Directory, um, and there is now a mailing list for discussing that with the hope of moving it forward. Uh, the kinds of changes are to get the document to reflect current practices. Uh, there's no intent to have the draft uh, create anything new. If the community wants to, that's fine. There certainly wasn't any intent in the draft that was done. The mailing list, the non-working group mailing list, uh, I suppose there's some irony in that, um, is WG Guide, W-G-G-U-I-D-E. Thank you. And I, I suppose you have posted the message on the ITF at the ITF org. Okay, good. Does that mic work now? I think you were first, Michael. I came over here because that mic historically all week hasn't worked. Um, <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> there you go. I jinxed it into working. <laughs> um, so I have heard from pretty much all of you as to, you know, in my various roles, as to what you think you are going to be doing to reduce your job to back to a 50% activity. Most of the people in this room have not, and I'm also curious to know if you guys have a plan as a group to reduce your jobs back to 50% of a 40-hour week, as the joke was, it's a 50% commitment of an 80-hour week, was the joke I heard several years ago, um, to be an AD. So I'm just wondering if some of you want to tell us if you have any group plans on reducing your own workload. Thanks. So, yeah, but, um, I, I wouldn't call it plans. I mean, so we, we, we try to, um, we had some discussion about this as the, the, the current kind of more minor reorg stuff was going on, and we agreed to, uh, you know, and analyze what we could do, and, and we didn't have time. <laughs> <laughs> Can we, we just However, stop for a moment of, of silence for the irony of that? <laughs> However, we're, we're, we're hoping, most of us are hoping to try and do that, so it, 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 it's, the sensible plan, which I think was Adrian's, was to measure what we do, see if there are some of those tasks that we can figure out ways to, I don't, delegate was not the right word, but I can't remember what the right word was, to, to, to get folks, you people, to do those things. 
Um, and I'm just, I just, we'll try and work on that between now and the retreat. We will either come up with good ideas or we won't. And we'll talk to you about them and we'll see. Yeah, and just interesting one thing that the internal of the ISG opinion has been that more work should happen in the working groups and, and less work in a centralized fashion. ISG. Barry. Yeah, I've, um, I'm looking at making changes to the applications directorate and having them help me more uh, with reducing the, the workload on document reviews and that sort of thing. Um, and we got rid of my co-AD, which should help a lot as well. <laughs> I think we're learning some stuff from the cross area, or at least I am. So taking on a couple of ops working groups, I see how they dealt with errata. So now the security area is helping us, the chairs are helping us a lot more to address those because that was one thing that Stephen and I just, we didn't have time for. And we're getting lots of uh, feedback from the chairs to help close those. So it's a small thing, but it, it you know, I think we may learn more as we get exposure to what other groups were doing with this cross area stuff. I think I've come up with a foolproof way to reduce my IESG workload. <laughs> Brian. <laughs> The other, thing to keep in, yeah, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, don't be surprised if you start seeing kind of some experimentations going on in different areas, not necessarily across the IESG, but at least in an area or two to see how things would work that could then be uh, scoped up to the entire IESG. Spencer? Um, yeah, a couple things, and I want to uh, mentioned specifically um, for the transport area, but the rest of you guys can listen if you'd like. 50% um, is still um, a heavy lift for <coughs> almost all of the people who would be reasonable candidates for area director positions in transport. Uh, the number, you know, the numbers we, Martin and I have, have tripped over about five people who said that they're willing to uh, stand for area director positions if we can reduce the time commitment. And um, it is relatively visible to the community how many, how many uh, willing nominees there are most years for those positions. Uh, if you provide feedback, you get to see who you, how many people you're providing feedback for. Um, so we're pretty serious about that. I've talked with um, Martin and I have talked with uh, the community at transport area meetings at all but one of the ITFs that I've been on the ISG for. Uh, we had a session on uh, Sunday afternoon trying to uh, work through some things with the uh, transport area working group chairs um, and like I said that that con that continues uh, it's also worth mentioning that the uh, revision to uh, 2026 that uh, allowed us to have uh, more than two area directors in routing is all yeah you know, I mean I was the editor for that draft so I've read it and um, it would also apply for transport if that was the right thing to do I'm kind of mindful of the time, so maybe we should move on to next question. Uh, Phil Han Baker. So I've got an issue with data models and data encodings in that, you know, at this point, Jason's the new data, play, data encoding of the month. And so we have a bunch of working group proposals, which you know, some of them are, let's see what's done in the past in JSON. And sometimes that makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. What really worried me was that I was in a JSON working group and then right that's about to close and then right at the end a group come in and say, oh, we want to do all this stuff again. But we're going to do another data format. We're going to do another encoding. And oh, because we need to tweak the parameters of our encoding, we will need a whole new working group. Now, from my point of view, if you have a new data encoding that's going to require you to set up a whole new working group just to tweak parameters, that strikes me as a flaw in this alternative data encoding. And I will point out that this is a flaw that I raised when the private submission, 
that was proposing this data encoding raised. And the only reason I couldn't raise it with the, at the time was it was a private submission and they told me, well, we don't need to talk to you. And then when it was anointed as a standard, <coughs> well, other things happened that you're aware of. That mistake is threatening now to create a whole new working group sized workload for you. I think it is time that if rather than repeat this for every JSON protocol, we look at an efficient binary encoding for JSON. We make it an open, con an open consultative process and we start from scratch rather than just allow the people who happen to have created a club, pushed everybody else out with their elbows and declared a standard, have their way. So this is from my, uh, one of my working groups. And the last part, the creating the club, that's actually part of why I suggested that they see if this should be a working group. Yeah, There's I, nothing I, approved. They just requested a mailing list. We'll see what happens. But it's really to break that up because now two additional working groups that were not involved in Jose have used cases that they'd like addressed through what might be done through CBOR um, because they're dealing with uh, constrained devices. So I wanna see where they get to and what they need to do and the requirements. And at the same time, I told you in the meeting, please put in the proposal to the Jose working group that you say fixes this in JSON. So please do that, we'll see what happens. But I'd rather go in parallel than hold up the entire work that, that folks need to get done. So ACE needs this stuff yesterday and they actually said they don't care if it's good or bad, they just need something right away. So they're in a huge time crunch. So parallel is good. Okay, so I'll give a brief opportunity for uh, Barry and Pete to say something, and then we'll move on in order to save time. So in addition to what Kathleen said about please make your proposal there, um, make a buff proposal for Prague to talk about the, a working group to do what you just said on the microphone, please. And I, I just wanted to up level one. Um, we've been sort of saying this mantra to a bunch of people, but so that everybody hears it. We've gotten much, much better about these sort of quick spin up, spin down working groups. Um, we can be pretty darn efficient about chartering and getting single work items done in a working group now. We've got at least four or five work examples, three or four work examples. Um, so the, the chartering process has gotten much smoother and we're thinking about these, get a piece of work done and then get it finished. Um, so hopefully that kind of thing will help these kinds of issues. And we seem to be faster also in closing the working groups. Uh, Stephen wanted to say something brief. Um, which one were you was first? David Meyer. I wanted to offer a couple of potentially larger suggestions on workload. First is that somewhere in all of the lengthy discussion about the how many areas we merge proposal was what I would look to me like a community interest in having some more generalist uh, ADs on the IESG. So if the out of area AD model is working well, think about adding a few generalist ADs who would serve as out of area ADs and should be the working group uh, load better across all of you. And the other is that for whatever reason, uh, the IESG review process is still by AD. Every time a draft goes uh, to the IESG, there's a 15 square box on the data tracker and every working chair and author wants to see how many of those boxes they can turn green. Think about whether this can be restructured by area, perhaps with a few additional ADs, and that might remove some of the expectation, both in the tooling and in the community, that everybody's got to do something about every draft. That's overkill for most drafts. Yeah, on that second point, I certainly agree. Um, one of my focuses, one of the things I tried to optimize when I, in my term on the IESG was to focus review time on drafts where I was going to add value in my review. Um, so I, I would encourage those who are sticking around to, to take that approach and to focus uh, AD reviews on, on drafts where you have some expertise. Spencer? Um, thank you for everything you've brought up. Um, 
I know in conversations I've had with uh, Pete, he uh, characterized himself as a, somebody who knew a lot about mail, but on the ISG was serving as a generalist. Um, I think it's amazingly obvious that that's what I'm doing. So I think we're kind of doing what you're talking about now, but we aren't really telling the community that that's a good, you know, that that's a good thing and making it obvious that other generalist people who could be willing nominees could also be considered and they might be a better generalist than I am. So uh, I think that's, I think that's a really, uh, really helpful suggestion. Um, we've had some conversations about uh, The, 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 the comment that you made about, you know, maybe stuff by area and not by AD. Uh, I think there, I think that that interplays with a bunch of proposals that have had come up over the year that I think might be, you know, we've been talking about within the ISG and I think that's helpful to, uh, to uh, keep, for us to keep that in mind. That's certainly something that we've been talking about with Stephen. Pete, um, just a quick comment. We, we do have two green ballots. One is yes and the other is no objection. Um, we use them a little individually, but um, I was telling someone earlier, when it comes to routing documents, um, I do a scan for the word string, UTF-8, text, um, and a couple of others. Um, everything else looks pretty much like a foreign language to me anyway, and I ballot no objection. Um, and occasionally that uh, algorithm works to find some problematic thing, but um, I, I think we all do have a sense, just because time is ridiculous, that um, we try and move to our expertise and try not to um, do detailed reviews of routing when we don't know that much about routing. Speaking of time, we'll be on to the next question. Um, yeah, uh, Keith Moore. Um, I'm kind of concerned about one particular working group uh, that I've seen several issues with this week, and um, that is the UR Invest Working Group. I'd like to bring that to the attention of the entire IESG. Um, this is a worker, working group that seems to be laboring without a lot of clueful input from the traditional IETF community, even though that's where the uh, specification came from. Uh, and being largely driven by people who are not traditionally inside that community. A lot of the communication seems to be behind the scenes. There are the current documents that they have, in my opinion, seriously undermine the technical sanity of your ends as existing current documents. Um, and I get told by multiple people that we have to do it this way for political reasons, because if we don't do it their way, then certain players in the group will go take URNs and standardize them elsewhere. And I don't think that political considerations should ever trump strong technical issues. Uh, so I, I, it, the, one of the things that bothers me about this is I get the, the same message consistently from multiple ADs and the main document author, which, which already tells me there's a problem because Normally, when there are objections, it's not exactly the same words from everybody. So I don't know, I don't know what's going on. And then sort of to, to uh, put icing on the cake, uh, they scheduled a meeting this week and then didn't show up. Apparently, the, 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 they canceled the meeting. The not, not enough of the players were there. And I feel like that should be a serious red flag anytime a working group schedules a meeting and then cancels it after people have already committed to spending money and time to be here. Um, so anyway, I, I basically just want to bring the group to people's attention. I want to try to resolve the technical issues. I've spent uh, a good part of my time this week making a very detailed write-up. Nothing that I'm raising hasn't been raised before and ignored by the group. So I just, again, I just want to bring it to your attention. So I, I have a couple of comments on that. Um, I am also concerned about the UN this working group for those and some other reasons, but um, so first on, close, on canceling the session, uh, this was one of probably half a dozen working groups who canceled their meetings this week, maybe, maybe four, not six, but there were several. Um, working groups do that if they, if something, if people don't show up at the meeting or whatever. Or um, they complete their work. 
yeah, if, if they can't have a productive meeting, they feel it's better not to have the meeting. There was no subtext there. I am not aware of anything going on behind the scenes there. So, you know, that part of it is, is different. And I do know that, that the active participants, apart from you, have considered your input. I understand your other concern that the library community, which is not the traditional IETF participants, are driving some of this. Um, your, your view is that it's political. My view is that it's the end users of this um, of this technology who are saying that, that what's there does not meet their needs. And I think we fail if we don't change it so that the technology does meet the needs of the uh, consumers. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very interested in having the library community, the international library community, be able to use URNs. Um, that was certainly always the intent that they be able to use URNs. However, the reason URNs were created was, was not to facilitate naming of fixed media resources, nearly so much it was to facilitate naming of network accessible resources. And the changes they're making all undermine the ability of URNs to do that, um, uh, in, my, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, I think, I guess the other thing, just, just one last little footnote here, which is that I, I noticed earlier in a, in a presentation earlier this evening, there's an effort to assign digital object identifiers to RFCs. And this is a competing standard to URNs. And this is, um, in some sense, I think, kind of undermining the work we're doing here in IETF. So I would really like to request that if we're going to assign DOIs, we also assign URNs to these things, and that we make them at least as prominent in our advertising and, and metadata and so on as we do the DOIs. I'm sure, so, uh, Keith, I'm sure you could. Uh... If somebody, if you wanted to do the work to arrange that to happen, and people might welcome it, I guess. I feel like the RFC editor should do as much work for that as they do for DOIs. Yeah, we, we already do have URNs for the. I'm, I'm aware of that. I just I'm talking about visibility. Yeah. And I closed the mic lines, by the way. So. West George, um, if we had more time, I would ask this in a different form. But since we're being short here, you got a new scheduling tool a few IETFs ago. Um, I would have asked. How's it going? Um, you know, is it better than the old tool? Is it doing better with uh, deconflicting and things like that? But all I can offer is really my own anecdotal evidence, which is that I've seen multiple times now where I have basically nothing that I can attend in one of the working group sessions, and I need to be four places at once in another, including this time around having to chair a working group session by myself because my co-chair was double booked. Um, I'm not saying that my experience is representative, but I think maybe the way to do this is it might be useful to ask during the post meeting survey, did you have situations where you were, um, where you had a double booking or a, situ uh, a session where you had nothing that was interesting to you? Just to kind of get some, some additional anecdotal evidence to see whether we need to tweak the work, the uh, I, algorithm. I, 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 I think we do have those issues, but at least my sense of it, that we had a huge improvement since we introduced the tool in terms of how easy it is to do and how easy to see things, what's going well and what's going wrong. Um, but, but it's not the tool or the algorithm. It's the, it's the fact that we have over constrained our problem uh, space because we have so many people who do, do so many things at the same time and the week is only a certain number of days. That's the problem. And, and certain number of tracks, certain number of rooms. Yeah, fair enough. And I think the one thing that would be worth considering, though, is whether or not there should be some sort of a priority put on trying not to double book working group chairs. It, that, that, that's already there. That was a one off. Um, but w one thing to mention is one of the things that caused that interference was um, we now have ways to enter priorities of first order conflict, second order conflict. Some people get very aggressive about their first order conflicts. So chairs mentioning um, things in a little more gradated uh, fashion would help as well. Okay, Leslie, the last word. Mm -hmm. uh, Leslie Daigle. Um, first of all, I want to thank Keith for alerting me to the fact that I haven't been paying enough attention to my calendar and hadn't noticed that your ambition was canceled tomorrow. If I'd have part of my afternoon back. Um, but second of all, uh, on the question of DOIs, I am absolutely no fan of the technology. Um, I could keep this here all night talking about the reasons why I think it's terrible. But 
it is the industry standard. And I don't see any reason that the RFC series should be in, in any way less um, undermined as a publication by not having them, so I'm glad that we're going to use them. On the, the substantive question of URMBIS, however, um, I agree with Keith that there's a lot of, the working group is in trouble, um, but to unpack a little bit of what Keith was getting at and, and maybe perhaps entice more people to get involved and look at it, I think the real problem is exactly that. It hasn't had enough attention. I mean, I admit I haven't been, it hasn't been on the top of my to read list uh, over the last months, but the challenge is that there, from my perspective, that the, it isn't getting enough cross review. There is a bit of a subsection of interested parties who are trying to drive in a certain direction. There are very well-intentioned efforts underway to write documents to move URNs forward. Um, and so we really should be reading this more, you know, in more depth and helping the working group come to closure um, so that we don't have to worry about it. So that's a plea to get more um, application area experience in reviewing the documents as specifications, irrespective of what one believes is the philosophy behind your ends, um, so that we can actually get this to closure. Thanks. Thank you, Leslie. Yes, thank you. And with that, thank you all. We're done. Oh, duck pass. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, we, we have one more thing to do. We need to pass the dots. And, uh, and, and just in case, if, if any of the ADs have misplaced their dots to be passed. We have extra dots and, you know, yeah, and, and so, so if we get wild tonight, we might decide that, oh, we'll add, you know, a few ADs to reduce the workload problem, but we'll see if that happens. <laughs> it's long.